If you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And we'll read that verse. Don't stand yet. But up until recently, I thought that Genesis 18 and 19 was the perfect Father's Day verse. And uh, let me read that to you in uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. And uh, like I said, I used to think this is was the perfect. And it is a great Father's Day verse. Uh, Abraham is one of my favorite uh, uh, characters in the Bible. And uh, because of the relationship he had with God. And, and of course, what God had said about him, which is, like I said, one of the, one of, a, a perfect, um, a, a great Father's Day verse. Listen to what it says. For I know him, this is God talking about Abraham, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. And, and so what's amazing is when you read that verse, it makes it sound that verse like he's a tyrant. But then when you read the rest of that verse where it says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. And what it talks about is how Abraham led by example. I preached a Father's Day, uh, a couple of Father's Day messages on that passage of scripture on uh, 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 Abraham himself being a great father. But and as I said, up until recently, I thought that was the pinnacle of the, of the great uh, verse in the Bible for Father's Day. But, but, uh, but something I have learned is, is here in 1 John chapter 5, verse, uh, um, verse 14 and 15. Now let's go ahead and stand. We'll read that verse, and I, I think you'll see what I mean. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. And of course, this is talking uh, about the confidence that we have in God, our, our Lord and Savior. And it says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. And I said in Sunday school this morning, I said what that's all about is, of course, uh, us being able to ask God for something and God have, God knowing because he knows from beginning to end knowing what's best for us um, if it's in his will what we ask then we receive but if it's not being the lover and father that he is then he doesn't allow us to receive something that may be harmful to us or, or uh, maybe not good for us and so that to me now is yes that Abraham verse is a great verse as a father, but there's no better father than our father, which is in heaven. Amen? And so this is the greatest example uh, of a father. And, and so um, what I want to preach on this morning is a little uh, Father's Day message uh, that can help us. And uh, so, Lord, uh, we pray that you help us. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I give more thankful. And Lord, I pray that you bless this time now that we have uh, in your word this morning. And uh, Lord, the challenge is uh, for us to ask ourselves what kind of picture we are. You know, as far as when we read uh, these verses and we look at uh, what it says here in 1 John chapter uh, 5, verse 14 and 15. And now it talks about a loving father who, when we ask him for things, if it's in his will, he knows what's best for us, uh, Lord, and he'll provide uh, that, that, that which is best for us. And so, Lord, when we think about that and the, the loving example that God is, the perfect example of God being our Father, uh, Lord, we pray that you help us this morning. Now, I know not everybody in this auditorium is a Father. I know uh, many in this auditorium are not even of the right gender to be a Father. And yes, we still stand uh, by, uh, uh, by identifying by gender. And uh, Lord, there's, your word shows us that there is a properness when it comes to uh, the subject of gender. And so Lord, we're thankful for your words. And we pray that you help us this morning. Pay homage to our fathers. But not only that, Lord, help us to realize that the same thing that helps a father to be a good father 
and that is, of course, the example of our Father in Heaven. Uh, those same things that help, the, the same examples uh, that help that father be a good father are, are the same things that mothers can learn from as well. And uh, fathers to be, and, and children that are yet to be parents, uh, Lord, they can be encouraged by this even. And so again, Lord, we're thankful for this time uh, that we have in your word this morning. Uh, just bless us now. Help us to learn from you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, there's some things that we want to look at this morning, of course. I'm going to take my first point right out of these first two verses that we read this morning out of 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Let me read it again. And you read along with me. Uh, as I read it, you follow along. It says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that is our Father in heaven, that if we ask anything according to his will, that means we can ask anything we want. Amen. You can ask anything you want, but he knows what's best for us. And so we can ask him for things. And if it's in his will and he says, yes, I will grant that to you, that is good for you, that's the right thing to ask for, then he's going to give it to us. But there's going to be times in our lives where we ask things that God has to say no. You know, we talked about this morning in Sunday school that think about these people who said, oh, Lord, if you would just give me a million dollars, oh, it would help me so much. You know, you, you hear about people who have uh, done things, you know, to gain money, and, and it's never happiness. You'll hear people who have, you know, and we don't agree with the lotto and all that kind of stuff. We think it's a waste of money and a waste of personhood uh, to do that. But you always hear stories about people who hit the lottery and win millions of dollars and it ruins their life. You'll hear that more than you'll hear anything else. That what happened is it really ruined their life. You see. And, and so... There's going to be times where, where we ask God for things and God has to say no. So the perfect example of, of a dad, and, and, you know, uh, sometimes what we have to realize is sometimes good parents, good daddies have to say no. Hey Amen. You know, passiveness is an easy, unchristian trait to slip into. What do you mean by that? Well, well think about this. As a child grows... Um, there is a normal trait that becomes apparent uh, in that used, it used to happen. I don't know if it happens so much anymore. The way kids are raised nowadays uh, to where they look more to their peers than they do to their parents. Uh, I don't know that there's the same kind of respect for parents today that kids had for their parents back in my day. Now, I hope that our teens uh, can learn that or, or still have that within them. But I know there's a lot of them out there today that they don't have proper respect for their parents. And when I'm talking about, there was a time, uh, like in my, my time, that as a, a child grew, it was normal, especially at certain ages, where a, a child would look to their parent, whether it was a, a, a girl looking to their mom or a, a boy looking to their dad, that they would have great admiration. You know, if, if you think back to when you were five, six years old, that is the prime age where a, a child looks to their parent and just idolizes them. They can't do no wrong. You know, they look to them for everything as, as far as the example and all that. And, and in any normal family, um, that is, and can I say it, I will say it, that a normal family to us is, is not uh, same-sex couples. That's not normal. You know, to have two women, one posing as a dad uh, and trying to be the fatherly figure, it's not, a, it's not normal. It's not normal in the Bible. And it surely isn't going to be normal here. You know, we go by what the Bible says, we preach what the Bible says, and, and it's not normal. And so what I'm saying is, is in any normal family, uh, children many times idolize their parents, you know. Uh, I know there's a, there's a rebellious age that I, even I went through, oh, I shouldn't say it that way, even I. Even I went through a rebellious age. Me, me, the pastor. Even I, no, I'm not saying it that way. I'm saying I went through a rebellious time when I was a teenager going up through high school. And don't talk to David because my mom talked to David and said things to David that, that uh, mom didn't even share with everybody. She does it every time she comes. But what I'm saying is this. There, I, I understand there are times when we grow, you know, as we go through our teenage years, that sometimes we don't idolize our 
And a lot of times it's because our parents want us to do things that we don't want to do. Our parents won't let us do things that we want to do. You know what that is? That's love. That's a, that's a, that's a, a parent that has the traits of God. Because what I'm saying is that verse right there that we're in this morning, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, that is the, that is the epitome of a loving parent. That he says, if you ask things that are in my will, that I, the things that I see that are good for you, then I, yes, I'll give them to you. But if they're not, if they're going to hurt you, then I'm not going to give them to you. That's the epitome of a, of a perfect uh, example of a father. Even a mother. And so, and so what I'm saying is, sometimes good parents, good daddies, have to say no. And, and there's a time, like I said, when, when parents look, or kids look to their parents and idolize them. There's a cute commercial that I've mentioned before on sports radio. I don't listen to a whole lot of sports radio anymore, but on sports radio, there's a cute, and, and I, it might even still run, but it was of a bragging uh, girl. A, a girl was bragging about her dad who was an insurance agent. And she said, uh, the, the whole premise is, of course, him being an insurance agent, he wants to sell insurance to uh, people who want protection. And she gets on there and says, you know, my daddy protects me, he can protect you too. And you can just tell by her voice that she idolizes her dad, you know. And, and so as, we, as I say this, sometimes uh, as, as parents, and you that are not parents yet, beware of this, that there's going to be some times in your life where you're going to have to say no. Because here's the problem. Um, idolized parents often become passive, meaning, meaning uh, Paisley, when you get married and you have children, you might have a daughter that just thinks the world of you. And, and you, of course, look to her like she can do no wrong, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what happens is a lot of times, because you have such affection for one another, uh, that sometimes she'll ask for things that you'll get to the point where you say, I know it's not good for her, but I, I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to hurt her feelings. She's such a good girl. And, and maybe it won't hurt just to let her do this one thing this one time. You know, I know it's not the right thing. And I, I know that she, you know, she's not ready to do something like that. But she's asking me and I just can't say no. And what I'm saying is that's passiveness. And it, and it comes out of a love, you know, that, that you don't want to hurt her. But what I'm saying is God is saying here in our verse that, that God is the perfect example of a parent. That he'll give us our needs as long as it's in, our, in his will. He, or I should say it that way. He'll give us our wants as long as they're in his will. But he knows what's good for us and what's not. And, and so what I'm saying is as a, as a picture of a parent, God is the perfect picture. But what happens is, uh, what we need to realize is that he is showing us that sometimes you've got to say no. And the problem is, you, if you're idolized by your kids, many times they have your heart strings. And many times what ends up happening is, because you're idolized by them, uh, you become passive. And you end up giving them things that, that maybe aren't good for them. Let me give you an example. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2. Here's the picture of a, I, I believe he was a loving parent. I believe he was a good parent. I believe he was an upstanding citizen. And who I'm talking about is Eli. Look back at First Samuel chapter uh, 2 and uh, look at verse 22. So First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 22. Anybody familiar with this scripture? That what happened with Eli? That, that what happened with Eli, let me tell you the story real quick, that Eli had two sons. And of course, this is back in the time when, uh, when men served in the temple. And at that time, to serve the temple, uh, you had to be of a certain uh, qualification. And it was even of a certain tribe back then. The Levites were the servants, uh, were the priests and all that in the temple. And so here's Eli. He's raised these boys. And back then, when you, you became a priest and became uh, servants in the temple and became the high priest and all that, it was all because it was family related. 
And so here's these two boys that they have grown up under this uh, man who serves God. And, and these two boys end up turning out to be uh, not spiritual. They call them in there sons of Belial, which means they didn't serve God, they served the devil. And so here's this, this godly man, and, and he's raising two boys, who what ends up happening is he can't say no to them. Uh, look what it says, First Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 22, kind of tells us a little bit of the story. It says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. In other words, they were doing wicked things. And Eli had heard about it. People were coming and telling him, Eli, man, your sons, I mean, you, you've had a great heritage as the priest here, the high priest in the temple, Eli. But your sons, they're doing wicked things around the temple that they're not supposed to be doing. And so Eli, what I'm telling you is Eli has heard all about this, even to the point where a prophet came to Eli and said, Eli, I'm warning you. This is God uh, talking through a man coming to Eli. Listen to what it says. Verse 22 in 1 Samuel 2 says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. So in other words, uh, here's Eli, and he's talking to his sons. And he's telling them, Why are you doing this? Now you might say, Well, it sounds like he's doing everything he could do. Well, read on. It says, And he said unto them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is not good. Report that I hear uh, ye make the Lord's people to transgress. Verse 25 says, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall treat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And so what I'm getting at is, is it looks like Eli did what he could do. I mean, he goes to these boys and he said, I'm hearing all this stuff that's going on. But what happened was, Eli didn't do enough. Apparently what I'm guessing is that Eli couldn't bring himself to just forbid them to do it any longer. He gave them a slight warning and said that what you do is not good. But I think sometimes it even gets to the point where dads, moms, parents-to-be, you got to put your foot down. Especially when it comes to God. Amen. You have to put your foot down. Even to the point where you say, you know what, if it's either, and I know this sounds harsh, it's either my way or it's the highway, you know. My dad, my dad said, his dad always used to say to him, as long as you put your feet under my table, you're going to do things my way. And if you don't want to, then you no longer put your feet under my table. In other words, out you go. I know that's harsh, but you know what we call it? Kind of, sometimes it's tough love. Amen. And, and I think where Eli missed out is he didn't get to that point. Because I think there was some of this where he was, he was a little bit passive with the boys. Now we know that. Look at, uh, look at the rest of the story. Look at verse 27 in that same chapter, I believe it is. 27, and there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto them. So what I'm getting at now is God a just God. Everything that you've been taught, everything that you know about God, is God fair? And, and sometimes when we read scripture, we don't always get all the story. And, and what I'm getting at is if I know that God's a just God and I know that he's a fair God, then I know somewhere down the line, God had warned Eli that, that the reason Eli came to those boys is because not only were people telling him what they were doing, but I think God himself had come to Eli and warned him, warned him, and told him what they were doing. Because, how do you know that? Because then I look at what God did. Look at what it says. I think what happened is God himself had talked to Eli, and Eli was passive. And says, okay, God, I'll deal with it. I'll go talk to them about it but he didn't go far enough. How do you know that? Because then look at verse 27. Because now all of a sudden, 
judgment has been determined. See, I believe God is a loving God. And what God will do is God will, God will warn us. God will tell us what's good and what's not. But God doesn't force us to do anything. We have freedom of will. Do you believe that? Do you have a freedom of will to make the choice you want? Don't think that because when you get saved, all of a sudden this, this uh, spiritual hand slides up your back and directs you everywhere you go. You know, and makes you talk and say the right things. Because it's not that way. You have freedom of will to say what you want, to do what you want, and to go where you want. You know what God's word said about Job? That, that Job was righteous, that means right with God, that Job was just. And, and it said that Job eschewest evil. You know what that means to eschew? It means that when Job came up to something that was wrong, he would step around it. He would, he would not go through it, he would go around it. And that's what we have to learn, is that, is that we have a freedom of choice to do right or wrong, Despite us being saved, despite us having the Holy Spirit, we have the choice to either follow the Holy Spirit or not, to follow God or not. And that's, I believe, the same thing with, with Eli. He had the ability to do right. He had the ability to correct those boys, but he didn't. Matter of fact, read the rest. It says in verse 27, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 27, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father, when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by the fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore keep ye at, uh, at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honors thy sons above me. Wow. God is, I mean, God is, can I say it this way? God is lighting him up. I mean, he is getting uh, chewed out royally. You know, God is saying to him, hear all I've done for you. Here I've, you know, I've spoke to you. And I've spoke to your fathers. Here you followed me. And, and here, now what you've done is you've chosen your sons over me. Look what it says. He says again in verse 29, Wherefore keep ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded into my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourself fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Uh, we won't get into all of it, but the, some of the wrong things that those boys were doing, Eli was profiting from it. And he knew it. And getting fat off it. That's a slap in God's face. Amen. And so what happens? It says in verse 30, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should, uh, should walk before me forever. But now, in other words, he had a guarantee that Eli, you know, you're always going to, your house is always going to be blessed. Now, now here's a good lesson for us. Don't think just because it says somewhere in here that that Christians are blessed when they get saved and that they'll be blessed. Don't think it's a across the board forever thing that's always going to happen. Because here's a man who is guaranteed that, that his family would be blessed and heritages and generations to come after Eli would be blessed. And you know what God did? He took it all back. He rescinded it. Says again in verse 30, wherefore the Lord of God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be highly, or I should say, lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm. What he's talking about is judgments coming. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth which God uh, shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. 
I mean, that's harsh. He says in verse 33, And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die of the flower of their age. He's saying, he's saying even the young men in Eli's house are going to die. There's going to be no heritage whatsoever. You know, that's one of the harshest judgments you could ever pass on a man. Is to tell those, those folks that in the future you're going to have no heritage. Everybody in your family is going to die and there will be no heritage. I mean, that's, that's harsh. But you know what? Eli has nobody to blame but himself. Because like I said, what it boiled down to is this Eli's dad, Eli, became passive and ended up choosing his children over God. Amen. Dads, listen. Again, it says in, in uh, I'm your dad, I'm listening. Uh, it says in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Isn't it a wonderful thing to think that your kids, when they come to you, if you can explain this to them and say to them, you know, loved one, realize this. There's going to be times you're going to come and want something from me that I'm not saying you can't have it just because I'm being spiteful and I don't want you to have it. And I never want you to have any fun and I never want you to have anything. No, it's not that at all. Always remember that I'm looking out for your best interest. That's what we tell our kids. Man, what a difference that would make in our family's life. Kids nowadays, what a difference that would make. Uh, and, and I'm not saying there aren't some uh, children out there that have that kind of relationship with their parent, but it's coming few and far between. you got parents now who have become to that path, they've gotten to that passiveness to where they think, you know what, I want to be my child's best friend. And how can a best friend say no to a best friend? See what I'm saying? And what I'm saying is the perfect example is what God showed us there in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. That means that when you read that verse, what that verse is telling us is just because God can do anything doesn't mean he will do just anything. Amen. So when we think about ourselves, have you ever asked God for something and later, thank God for not answering your prayer. Now, so what I'm saying is even, uh, especially us older folks, uh, we can look back at some things that we desired and prayed about, and for some reason we didn't get it. And yet, now we can look back at where we came from and say, I see exactly why God didn't want me to have that. I can't give a specific example, but, but I know there's been a lot of things in my life to where I've asked for specific things and God didn't give it to me and come to find out good thing he didn't because he had totally different plans that were much better for me. See what I'm getting at? And so, again, can I say that first point is this. Sometimes good parents have to say no. And that's the exact example that God is giving us in 1 John chapter 5. And then there's something else I want to show you. Sometimes, um, good parents have to um, discipline. Or I should say it this way. They have to apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. Turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. Look what it says. In that verse, when you find it, it starts with the verse, uh, or the word for. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You might know what chasten to chasten means. It says, uh, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scorbeth every son whom he receiveth. In other words, what he does is he, is he disciplines. And everyone receives discipline from God. Why is that? Because we have a sinful nature. Nobody's perfect. When you get saved, it's not like all of a sudden you're perfect. 
Amen. We have a sin nature. When we get saved, I tell people this. Um, you still maintain your sin nature. You still have your sin nature. Now, you have a spiritual nature as well. And I said, that's when the battle comes. Because your spiritual nature battles against your sinful nature. I always tell everybody, Romans 7 is the perfect picture. It's when Paul's talking about those things I want to do, I don't do. And those things I don't do, I do. And he's talking about the nature that's in us. That sinful nature. That when you get saved, it doesn't automatically purge you of the sinful nature. Matter of fact, you never lose the sinful nature all the way up until death. And so there's always a battle raging on within you. And what I'm saying here is, is what God is telling us in that verse. It says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. In other words, there's times we all need correction. And it says, and he scourges every son whom he receiveth. You know, I know what people say, Pastor, what if, what if the community finds out you condone spanking? You know what I say? I don't care. Because, uh, you know, the Bible, the Bible, you know, talks about, I believe there's much scriptural support uh, for spanking a child. Listen to what Proverbs 13, 24 says. Don't turn there, but it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. There's that word again. So what we're talking about is correction by sometimes... A little bit of a forcefulness. Forcefulness. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Uh, Proverbs 23, 13 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Now, I know that sounds harsh, you know, but what we're talking about it is chastening, correcting a child. You know, when a when a child, uh, you know, when you think about some of the things that child troubles that child children get into, sometimes you've got to correct them. You know, a little a little child that starts very young in age, a little child, two or three years old, might always want to touch fire, and sometimes what you got to do, like like uh, Micaiah's age. I don't think he's even two yet. He'll be two in July. Micaiah, many times, probably what he does, and he's already he's already had trouble. Um, he burned himself. He pulled a uh, pan of hot water or a, a cup of tea. It was a cup of hot tea on himself. And what has to happen is many times what you got to do is correct him. Like a, a two under a two year old, he walks up, and touch a red hot burner because it looks cool. You have to take their hand and smack their hand. That's the kind of chastisement we're talking about. And if you start young and do it when they're young, they don't need it when they're older. You know, they learn. And that's what God's talking about. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And so when we get saved, it's the picture, it's the picture of being born into a family. And that our loving Father corrects us. And sometimes has to chasten us. Now, I understand there are cases out there where an ungodly parent or someone in, a, in that role abused this principle. But to give you an illustration, and I've used this before, just recently, but just because the principle was abused doesn't mean it negates the principle. What do you mean by that? Well, here's an example, one that would be very familiar to us right now. Cops are protecting the cert, Correct. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Their job is to, to, to protect and to serve. Now, with the latest allegations of cops abusing citizens, does that mean we do away with cops? No, they abuse their position. Amen. And so, so what happens is, just like I said, it doesn't negate the principle. We don't do away with cops. It's the same way I gave also the example of an abusive husband. And I said, if, you know, there are abusive husbands out there that abuse their wives. There's even been times, and you've all heard it, uh, where a husband abuses his wife and even kills her. But it doesn't mean you do away with husbands, you know. It doesn't mean I should be, you know, executed or put away in prison. 
because of the wrongdoing of another husband. You understand what I'm saying? It's the same way with cops. It's the it's the same way with parents. It's the same way with with chastisement, with correcting your child. Just because someone abused it doesn't mean it negates the principle of using it. You see what I'm saying? And so, so can I say it again? Good parents know how to correct and know how to chastise and do it correctly. And and finally, um, a good parent does not have how would you say it the the attitude of, to their to their children as a do as I say not as I do. Just realize that that won't do. In other words, and, and, and turn to back to Genesis chapter 18. And that's what I loved about Abraham. That he wasn't a do as I do, not as I uh, do as I say, not as I do parent. And that's what God loved about him. That's what God, that's why God gave him accolades, uh, probably the greatest accolade for a father in all the Bible was right there in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. And it wasn't because Abraham was a tyrant. It's because you can see the example that God was giving is that Abraham, his example was he led by example. He didn't say, do as I say, not as I do. Look what it says in verse 19 again, Genesis chapter 18. For I know him, this is God talking about Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him. You know what that means? When it says uh, after him, when you read that, you study that out, it says, uh, and his household after him. It means, he says, follow me. Do as I do. Let me lead by example. He commands them by his actions. You look at that again, it says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. Is that a weird way to say that? No. It's because he's saying, God is saying about Abraham, he's a great parent, he's a great father, and all parents should look to this example that what he's saying is he, he's not a tyrant. He's not saying, do as I say it, not as I do. He's saying, follow me as I follow God. That's what he's doing. What a great example. Amen. Now, what a, what a challenge we have as parents. And, and what a book we have. Now, you don't need to go out and get all these uh, parenting books like Dr. Spock. And that's, a, that's a goofy mess. You, know, you got exactly what David's got. And that is, you got the greatest parenting book you'll ever have. And that is God's book. Father, again, we're grateful. And Lord, I pray that you continue, Lord, to grow us closer to you. And again, we're thankful for uh, this morning and, and uh, Lord.